All right, guys, welcome back to another organic chemistry lecture. This is lecture three, which is entitled Polar Covalent Bonds and Polarity, a Lesson in Sharing Electrons. So we're going to talk about uh, bonds in organic chemistry and how bonding occurs in organic chemistry. And in particular, we're going to talk about sharing of electrons and how electrons aren't always equally shared when we have bonds. So this is something we have discussed in general chemistry, especially if you were in my general chemistry class. A lot of this should be a refresher, but there may be some new material here. Uh, as we continue on in this chapter, which we're now officially in Chapter 2, we will certainly come across things that are new in organic chemistry that we haven't really discussed in detail before. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so the first thing we want to talk about is bonding in organic chemistry, and this is going to be a bit of a recap of bonding from general chemistry. So I want to review some of that first. In general chemistry, we distinguished between covalent and ionic bonds. And we said that covalent bonds involve a sharing of electrons, while ionic bonds involve a complete transfer of electrons. There was no real sharing of electrons involved in an ionic bond. And so when we're dealing with this, covalent bonds do share electrons. The sharing of electrons uh, is not always equal between the atoms. So many covalent bonds are somewhat in between a complete sharing of electrons to almost an ionic bond, where you would have close to a transfer. Such bonds are known as polar covalent bonds, when the sharing is not equal for the electrons. Polar covalent bonds. In a polar covalent bond, electrons are attracted more strongly to an atom than to another, so that would be an unequal electron sharing. And you can see in this figure down here, the ionic character increases as we go from left to right. So we have a symmetrical covalent bond, often called a nonpolar covalent bond, symmetrical meaning that the electrons are shared between two symmetrical atoms, there's no difference between them. And then if you move one over, we have polar covalent bonds, and for polar covalent bonds, you can see the electrons are being hogged by whichever atom has more what's called electronegativity, which we're going to talk about soon. This delta minus means a partial negative charge, but not a full negative charge. And then, of course, if we actually get to an ionic bond, we have a full positive and negative charge in which the negative substance, so for instance, if this was Na plus and Cl minus, the Cl minus completely takes the electrons in that relationship. That would be an ionic bond. So hopefully the, everybody remembers that. So let's discuss electronegativity, which I just mentioned a moment ago. Um, bond polarity is due to the absolute difference in electronegativity values. So if you remember, there's a periodic table that ha is specifically assigned to electronegativity values associated with each element. So what is electronegativity? Electronegativity is the intrinsic or internal ability for an atom to attract electrons to itself when it is participating in a covalent bond. That's the best definition that you could probably get. In other words, it's the atom's affinity for electrons. Some of you guys may remember we talked about electron affinity as one of the periodic trends. The higher the affinity or want for electrons, the more electronegative an atom is going to become. So that's electronegativity in a nutshell. The greater the absolute difference in two electronegativity values, so we have a bond, we have two different atoms, they each have an electronegativity value, we take the absolute difference between their electronegativity values. The greater that absolute difference is, the more polar a bond has become until it approaches ionic character, in which case we have a complete transfer of the electrons. So you can see here from a difference, an absolute difference, of 0.0, .0 to 0 0.5 is nonpolar covalent. There's an equal sharing or almost an equal sharing of electrons when we're in a small difference range like that. Then we increase 0 0.5 to 2.0 is polar covalent. There's an unequal sharing of electrons, and as we climb that scale, the closer we get to 2.0, the more polar it's going to become. So the higher the unequal sharing is going to become. And then at 2.0 and above, we go to ionic. So some students will ask me, well, what if it's 2.0? Is it polar covalent or is it ionic? 
it's hard to say. Ionic is really a metal and a non-metal. These are general guidelines. If you're on the edge with one or the other, you can probably pick one. Um, if it's exactly on the edge, I would start heading a little bit more towards the, uh, the higher level. So if I'm at 0 0.5, I'd probably classify it as a very weak polar covalent bond than I would a non-polar covalent bond. But that's just my preference. Uh, you guys can do whatever. So when an atom has polar influence in a bond, we often assign it a partial charge. And that's the next thing we're going to look at here. And we saw that on one of the previous slides, that little delta. Oh, before that, uh, I just wanted to bring up the electronegativity table here. You can see these each have values assigned. So for instance, if I wanted to look at a carbon-hydrogen bond, it would be 2.5 minus 2.1. That would be 0 0.4. And if we take a look and go back, we see that 0 0.4 would fall in the nonpolar covalent region. So if we have carbon chains that just have a bunch of hydrogens, which is a very common thing in organic chemistry, if we have nothing but a bunch of CH bonds, all of those bonds would be considered nonpolar covalent. The hydrogen and carbon are going to have a pretty close to equal sharing of electrons. And you can do that with anything here. So carbon fluorine, we have 4.0 and 2.5. The difference in a carbon fluorine bond would be 1.5. That is certainly polar covalent. That's pretty high on the polar covalent scale, which is 0 0.5 to 2.0. All right. Um, if you guys need a refresher on that, you can go back to the general chemistry section uh, and we talk about electronegativity and how to use that table a little bit more. Hopefully you're familiar with it. So let's talk about these partial charges. When we're representing polarity, which is often referred to as dipoles, and then a molecule can have a dipole moment, uh, which will be determining whether the molecule overall is polar. So when an atom, when an atom has a polar influence in a bond, we will assign it a partial negative charge. And then the less polar atom is going to receive a partial positive charge. And note that the full charges, if we had full charges, that would be ionic in character. So instead, when we're doing polar covalent character, we're keeping these partial charges and we use the delta sign to give the partial positive or partial negative. That delta means partial when we're doing this. So you can see here, here's carbon, here's chlorine, if we look at the electronegativities between those, chlorine would be more electronegative, and so it takes the partial negative. Carbon would take the partial positive. And you can see that there. Chlorine is at the negative end of a dipole, and carbon is at the positive end. So look at that arrow that's there. It's very common to draw an arrow with a line through the tail, the way that we see here, in the direction of the more electronegative element, in this case chlorine. So if we look at this example, you see carbon is the positive one, or the partial positive. Chlorine is the partial negative. And so we would draw the dipole for this molecule headed up towards the negative end with a little uh, tail through that arrow that we have there, drawing a line through the tail. So um, I want to bring up a term called inductive effect. And the ability, uh, an inductive effect is really an effect that's seen due to a shift in electrons within a bond due to the influence of surrounding atoms, which is a bit of a mouthful. So the ability to polarize a bond is an example of an inductive effect. So what it's essentially saying is the electrons are going to behave or move in a certain pattern based on the influence of the surrounding atoms. So if this was just another H here, instead of a chlorine, we would have a pretty equal sharing of electrons. But suddenly when a chlorine appears, the electrons behave differently. There's an inductive effect where the chlorine starts drawing in the electrons towards itself. Um, so while this is one example of an inductive effect that we've seen here, there's going to be many more throughout the class. So it's sort of a good idea to understand inductive effects, which are really effects with electrons based on surrounding atoms and their properties. So let's switch gears here for a second. We've been talking about bond polarity, but we also can talk about molecule polarity, the entire polarity of a molecule. Um, so just as bonds can be categorized as polar or nonpolar, molecules themselves can be determined as either being polar or nonpolar. Now, a lot of times at first glance, this can be confusing because the overall polarity of a molecule can be nonpolar, 
despite the presence of many polar bonds within the molecule. So this can sort of throw students for a loop when they're first looking at this. So we need to sort of define how we're looking at polarity of a molecule and determining is the entire molecule polar. We're really going to look for symmetry. So polarity for a molecule results when a net flow of the electronegativity or the dipoles is not equal and opposite in all directions of the molecule. So we're going to, dry, we're going to draw these little dipole vectors and we're going to see if they are equal and opposite in all directions. Conversely, an atom that would have an equal and opposite dipole vectors, that would be considered a net dipole of zero and it would be considered nonpolar. So let's look at some of the examples. HCl. H and Cl certainly have a stark difference in their electronegativities. However, there is only one vector. So there is not an equal and opposite pulling here. So this would be considered a polar molecule. Let's look at NH3. The nitrogen is more electronegative than the hydrogens, and while I have three of them spaced out at 120 degrees, they're not going in opposite directions. So this is equal, but it's not opposite. I've got a pull going up towards the nitrogen. All three directions go up towards the nitrogen. They're not in opposite directions. So let's take a look at the opposite. If I have boron trifluoride, so I have a boron and then three fluorines, now I have a pull in equal and opposite direction, direction. So the fluorines make it equal. It's all fluorine the whole way around. That's an equal pull. Fluorine pulls here, it pulls up, and it pulls to the left. But it's the opposite direction that's needed to make this nonpolar. I'm going in opposite direction. So look at this as almost a three-way tug of war. Whereas for the NH3 up here, instead of a tug of war, all the opponents are coming and meeting in the middle. So hopefully you guys can see that. Another nonpolar example would be CCl4. So if I have four chlorines, they're 109.5 degrees apart, approximately, and I'm going to be having a pull in each of the direction of the chlorines. Those are all equal pulls if there's four chlorines. However, they're all also in the opposite direction. So the up cancels out the down and the left cancels out the right, so this would be nonpolar. That does not mean that a carbon-chlorine bond is nonpolar. It means that CCl4, the overall molecule, is nonpolar. That's what that's telling us. And then we can look at the uh, situation over here to the right where we have CH3Cl, which is an example we looked at slightly earlier. We said, oh, there would be a partial negative on the Cl, a partial positive on the C, so the dipole moment goes up towards the Cl. Well, in this case, these Hs are not Cls, so there's not going to be an equal pull in these directions. We're going to have a unified pull up towards the chlorine. Because it's not equal and opposite, it's going to be polar. So remember, if you have equal and opposite dipole vectors canceling one another out, you will be nonpolar. If you have a maybe equal but not opposite, or if you have not opposite but equal, etc., if you don't have the opposite and equal, you're going to be considered polar. You will have a net direction in one specific way, and that's going to give a polarity to your molecule. So hopefully this makes sense. So that's going to wrap up this lesson. Next time we're going to head into looking at formal charges and we're going to get into a little more detail about resonance, which we did talk about in general chemistry, but it's going to become very important in organic chemistry. It explains a lot in organic chemistry as we get into further chapters. So thank you all for stopping by and learning. Keep uh, improving your knowledge as always. And please remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you found the video helpful. That will also allow you to figure out when new videos are posted. So thanks a lot, guys, and I will see you for the next lesson.